Half a century has passed since the first men flew to the moon. Is it still an attractive travel destination a whole generation later? Could the moon become a second Earth? Our eighth continent? sun sank, the earth fell into darkness and only the moon lit up the night. It has long since ceased to be the only light in the night sky. That was before man invented electric light. In our illuminated world, the moon almost seems a bit like a relic from ancient times. Is it still a scientific challenge at all? If I had the choice, I'd definitely land on the moon or on Mars. I'd like to go to the moon, but I'd also like a ticket for the return flight. My intention is to build up a permanent uh, base station on the moon. In our present form, we're completely unsuited to a stay in space or on the moon. It's a place that's completely hostile to life. I imagine it's great when you're standing on Earth looking at the moon and you know there are people there. On July 16, 1969, the sun rises over Florida's swamps, as it does every day. Where normally only snakes and crocodiles meet, the greatest technical adventure of modern times is about to take place. At 6.32 a.m., three hours before launch, on pad 39A, Armstrong and Aldrin walked on the surface of the Earth. Their next steps would be on the moon. One million people alone around the shuttle station are eagerly following the astronauts' final hours before their flight to the moon. The atmosphere is a cross between a tent camp and folk festival. Hippies, diplomats, curious people from all over the world want to experience the historical moment. Outside, the colorful hustle and bustle. Inside, tension and absolute concentration. The day began. Astronauts. Neil Armstrong, Commander Apollo 11. Edwin Buzz Aldrin, Lunar Module Pilot. Michael Collins, Command Module Pilot. Can the flight they've all been working towards together for years succeed? Five seconds and counting. Neil Armstrong reported back when he received the good wishes. Thank you very much. We know it will be a good flight. Sergeant, go. Captain Comwork, go for undocking. Negative flight. Leave the crew reported. We got a man. 470 engineers monitor the countdown on endless rows of computers. Is the century old vision of the man on the moon about to come a reality? Ten, nine, ignition sequence start. Five, four, three, two, one, zero. All engine running. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. 32 minutes past the hour. Liftoff on Apollo Three people are about to travel to a place that until recently seemed impossible to reach. The moon. With a shuttle measuring 111 meters, the Knights of the Grail of the Technological Age, as the author Norman Mailer christened them, are traveling to their rendezvous with the moon. They are due to land in the Mare Tranquillitas, the Sea of Tranquility, on the near side of the satellite. Their message, we come in peace and on behalf of all humanity. I remember being allowed to get up at night at three o'clock in the morning 
And we were with the neighbors. They had a TV that worked, and we could watch it. The pictures were blurred. People were about to enter another celestial body for the first time. And you were a part of it here on Earth. Television viewers didn't realize how dramatic the final minutes before the landing of the lunar ferry were. Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin headed off in the lunar ferry. Michael Collins remained in the command capsule of the mothership. At first, everything went according to plan. Then, however, small orbit deviations led the lunar ferry on its approach onto our cosmic neighbor, directly into an impact crater 33 meters wide and four meters deep. For a landing that could not have been more unfavorable. Armstrong takes over manual control and flies 60 meters further to a flat plane with fuel for just another 20 seconds of flight time. A new era of mankind, the future, is about to begin. It's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. The flight to our cosmic neighbor took 102 hours and 45 minutes. 528 million people watched the launch. NASA estimates that every fourth inhabitant of the Earth watched at least part of the mission on TV. I was around five years old back then, but I can still remember very clearly this hollow sound of the first words that were spoken there. These strange movements, I remember it very vividly. Actually, more than almost anything else that has to do with the moon. It's Cold War time. The moon landing sends a political signal. They were Americans, but it was all of humanity that took part. And that, I think, influenced the lives of millions of people. The mission lasted a total of eight days before the world welcomed the Apollo astronauts back home. The glowing dot in the sky is the command capsule re-entering the Earth's atmosphere. On July 24, 1969, at 1650 Universal World Time, the capsule landed in the Pacific. I'm sure when man. I'm sure if you look 10,000 years into the future and look back at our era, you will remember one thing for sure, and that is that humans left the Earth. For the very first time, life on Earth left the planet. In retrospect, I'm sure that this is as significant as the first fish to leave the ocean. The rendezvous in space, the the climax of a long relationship between man and moon. After epochs of observing the night sky with the naked eye, the patterns of the moon with binoculars and telescopes, it took only four months for the next manned flight to take off. Twelve American astronauts are the only people to ever have set foot on the celestial body. The Apollo lunar mission ended with Apollo 17 in 1972. But none of the moonwalkers were as celebrated as much as the first two people on the moon. What more is there to come? Gloria Meinen is a scholar in cultural studies. She's working on a history of the future that she believes began in 1969. 
Astronauten sind eigentlich die neuen Astronauts are really the new discoverers. In the 15th century it was the seafarers, Columbus, then came the cowboys, and then the astronauts in the 60s. It's quite interesting that the notion of the frontier, of the discovery of America, was taken over in space travel. It's no wonder that people wanted to be closer to the moon, that the view from Earth eventually ceased to satisfy them. Back in 1500, a Chinese man is said to have dared to embark upon the first journey to the moon. Wan Hu, a visionary and inventor from the Ming Dynasty. Gentlemen, let's go to the moon. Legend has it that he attached 47 firework rockets to a chair. These were to provide the necessary thrust for a journey into space. When the smoke clears, Wan Hu and his chair have disappeared. No one knows how far he has traveled. His assistants certainly never saw him again. Nevertheless, he achieved his goal. A crater on the dark side of the moon is named after him in his honor and because of his foolhardiness. Wan Hu is considered to be the first astronaut whose destination was the moon. And today? It's also a personal dream of mine to look a little further, to carry a little bit of light into the darkness. If I could, I wouldn't hesitate one second to go to the moon or to Mars. Alexander Gerst, commander of the ISS. When he's not researching in space, he is enjoying the miracle of Earth without life support systems. Today is already training for the next flight to the moon. In case technology fails, astronauts learn how to navigate with a sextant. Repair work on the outside of the spaceship is trained in a virtual laboratory. What looks more like a game here is intended to save lives in an emergency. The commander of the ISS repeatedly runs through every conceivable disruption in order to be able to react intuitively in a real emergency. One, two, three. And this at an altitude of about 400 kilometers above the Earth. Space, nothing is possible without a spacesuit. The fitting for the upcoming expeditions. A spacesuit is a fascinating thing. It's really a small spaceship. It has everything it needs to be considered a spaceship. It has a life support system, an electrical system, a thermoregulation system, a radio system. It's fascinating that you can put all this in a suit that weighs 160 kilos, but it's still so small and maneuverable that you can move around in it. So klein und wendig ist, dass man sich darin bewegen kann. Seen from space, it becomes clear that we humans are an island people. We live on a tiny island surrounded by a large black ocean. For scientists like Alexander Gerst, we are well advised to explore the cosmic vastness. But long before science really flew out into space, poets and writers traveled to the moon. Some of their visions were so specific that space travel still looks as if it had copied some of their designs. They were, of course, all avid readers of Jules Verne, both the astronauts and Werner von Braun, for example. So if you read his two moon novels, it becomes obvious that he was not only a prophet, but that there also was a strong support by the astronauts and engineers to make reality resemble science fiction. Exactly a hundred years before the Apollo mission, the French novelist and poet Jules Verne published his double novel De la Terre à la Lune, From the Earth to the Moon, which reads like an amazingly realistic draft of the later spaceflight. 
Im Laufe des Jahres 1869 wurde die ganze Welt von einem beispiellosen Experiment in Atem gehalten. Die Mitglieder des Gang-Clubs waren auf die Idee verfallen, mit dem Mond in Verbindung zu treten. Jawohl, mit dem Mond und ein Geschoss in den Himmel hinaufzuschicken. Jules Verne is, of course, in this context, the most important figure. He was, at his time and long into the 20th century, actually completely underestimated. About 100 years before the flight to the moon, he basically had everything already on his desk. And it's amazing how even different details can be found in the actual moon flights. Let's start with the number of astronauts. There were three on the first flight, and also three in his story. Then the place of launch, for example. I think it was 200 kilometers away from the actual one. And even the fact that the capsule ultimately landed in the Pacific. Fifty years after Apollo, mankind is planning another journey to the moon. And this time it's for more than just a walk. ESA Director General Johann Dietrich Werner has put the moon back into the spotlight. When we started to focus more on the moon a few years ago, there was a lot of worldwide skepticism at first. They said, what do you want there? It's a dead stone. Others said that it's not challenging enough. We want to go further. That has totally changed in the last three, four years. The idea is taking shape. In the assembly halls of the space agencies, technicians are working on the spaceships of the future. Orion, the new American-European space capsule, is to take astronauts back to the moon for the first time. Whether it's going to be 2020, 23 or 25 is not yet clear, but the launch will come. First of all, we're not going back to the moon, we're going forward to the moon. That's a very important point for me. We don't want to repeat what happened in 69. It's a completely different plan this time. And that's why I say forward to the moon. We're moving further on. Space travel needs great visions. They are already within reach in elaborate animations. Our closest neighbor is seemingly still the most suitable for generating the necessary enthusiasm for a project, so that it can be also financed. The plan is to build research stations on the moon, a kind of base camp for which one can also penetrate deeper into space. In a nutshell, the moon and Mars are nothing more than the eighth and ninth continents of the Earth. This is our cosmic environment. They seem far away, but if you think about it, the Moon is a week's journey away. It's less than the journey to Antarctica took 100 years ago. Daring engineers, experimental scientists and inventors were willing to risk their lives for the idea of building a rocket that one day would reach the planets. Without these pioneers, space travel would be inconceivable today. For the explorers among us, at some point the Earth ceased to be a gripping challenge. There were no new destinations, so the new motto was, off to the moon. I find it fascinating what people can imagine. Zeppelins, airships, journeys to the moon, everything had already been thought up before it actually happened. In 1902, the premiere of one of the first science fiction films is celebrated in Paris. In the film, the director Georges Méliès sends a group of astronomers to the moon. Georges Méliès steers the rocket bang into the eye of our cosmic neighbor. Ouch! 
Jules Verne's novel, The Journey to the Moon, provided the blueprint for this defining work from the early years of film history. Georges Méliès, that's of course fascinating, almost like a caricature. The way the rocket hits the moon cake, I think he's also taking this whole fascination with the moon for a ride. Cologne-based art historian Andreas Blum can't stop thinking about the moon. A few years ago, he collected around 150 exhibits that showed how people have approached the moon again and again over the past five centuries. As is often the case with exhibitions, you have an idea, and with the moon there are, of course, millions of pictures, and then you start collecting. The greatest thing is the pictures you didn't even know about that you suddenly find. Caspar David Friedrich, Edouard Manet and many other artists have painted the atmospheric moon for us. But the art historian does not find what is probably the most astonishing painting among the big names. It comes from a Bavarian landscape painter. He painted the moon as if he was standing on it, with the Earth in the background, exactly as the astronauts from the Apollo mission saw it. And this, although when Wilhelm Kranz painted his ideal moon landscape in 1919, man had still to set foot on the Earth's companion. It was only the Apollo astronauts that took the famous photo of the rising Earth The Apollo astronauts told us that from the moon, you can almost cover the Earth with your thumb in front of your eye. Everything you know, the whole of life on Earth, if you can hide it behind a thumb, that does something for us, with us. On December 24, 1968, the astronauts of the Apollo 8 mission saw the Earth rise. Earthrise, the photograph they were able to take while in lunar orbit, was soon to gain iconic status. Arguably, it is still the most influential environmental photograph ever taken. Ultimately, this flight turned our gaze around from moon to earth. It really shook people up inside to see the earth from the outside. And ultimately, it was the beginning of the environmental movement. The earth, the blue planet as a jewel in space, the island of life on which one could see no borders. After a few days, all the astronauts only saw this one earth as our common home. For the astronomer, the insight is the story worth being retold, the story of mankind and the moon. In his Theatre for Humankind and Environmental Space, as Thomas Kraupe calls the Hamburg Planetarium, you can experience it up close. One small step for me. <laughs> Here he steers the Apollo mission. It's a kind of flight simulator that allows you to be an astronaut without taking the risks, without a lack of oxygen. Of course, you're not leaving the Earth, but you can fly anywhere and in 360 degrees. On this evening, the program Fly Me to the Moon is taking place, a musical review around the Apollo mission. Recent musical compositions based on the moon landing could easily fill an entire evening event. And then, in front of the planetarium, lovers, insomniacs, and moon-worshipping space travel enthusiasts meet and let themselves be enchanted by the moon. Paris in 1830. This poster caused a sensation. Claude Rougerie, known for his daring stunts and unprecedented fireworks, is planning to send a child into space and bring it back safely. 
No one has ever dared to try this before. Die Rakete fliegt in den Himmel. Und wenn sie dann wieder zur Erde zurückstürzt, keine Angst, keine Angst. Dann öffnet sich der Fallschirm. Monsieur Claude Rigéry? Anwesend. Was? Ah. Hier. Die Papiere für die Starterlaubnis. Und nun bitte. Die Rakete wird also zur Erde zurückstürzen. Äh, Im Namen der Stadt Paris ersuche ich Sie, den Start einer bemannten Rakete unverzüglich abzubrechen. Kommandant, die Rakete ist perfekt. Claude Rougerie, Pyrotechnician of Distinction, has already used the rocket to shoot a lamb up into the air and brought it back to Earth alive with a parachute. For Rougerie, the dream of the first manned rocket flight has been shattered. The ingenious inventor has no idea he is far ahead of his time. Far too much. To date, parachutes safely bring astronauts back to Earth from space. Florida. Hundreds of thousands of moon-loving people come to the Kennedy Space Center every year to follow in the footsteps of the Apollo astronauts. The relics of the technical adventure can still be admired here today. The legendary lunar ferry, the Eagle, and the gigantic launcher. But the highlight for all tourists is probably to record their own moon landing in the studio. One small step for everyone. The further back in time the event took place, the less likely it seems to many people that it happened at all. To them, the Apollo mission is one big lie. Propaganda, because the space race had to be won. Suspicious footprints, a waving flag. No crater under the lunar ferry. For conspiracy theorists, this is all evidence that the moon landing never took place. They believed that the first steps on the moon were recorded in a film studio on a secret military base. According to research, there's a growing number of people who believe this because they did not personally experience it on television at that time. That seems to be a critical factor. Around 400,000 people were involved in the Apollo program. To swear them all to secrecy would have been quite difficult to achieve. The Soviet rivals were also able to monitor and locate the radio traffic of the American astronauts. Anyone who wants solid proof that the Apollo landings really took place should go to Bavaria. The Geodetic Institute Wetzel can be found close to the Czech border. This is the home of the Lunar Laser Rangers. Without the moon landing, they would not be able to do their observations. Well, if it's all just a bluff, how did the reflector get there? Because we've been able to spot it from here for over 50 years now. They had also already successfully measured the distance to the moon using laser when the astronauts were still up there. Even before the astronauts raised the flag of the United States, they position a laser reflector on the surface of the moon allowing for extremely accurate measurements to calculate the distance to Earth. For this purpose, laser beams are sent from ground stations to the reflector on the moon. The running time of the laser is measured. This is how the distance between the Earth and the moon has been determined for 50 years. The data show that the moon moves 3.8 centimeters away from the Earth every year. They want to get closer to the moon again. Harold Thiesinger and Marcus Langraf were commissioned by the European Space Agency to find new targets for the next manned lunar mission. What is exciting for the planners of the mission is that water was found on the moon, or to be more precise, ice. It can only be found in deep craters where the sun never shines. The temperatures there are around minus 250 degrees Celsius, 
Should astronauts really land there? The water on the moon is a tremendous resource for us because the astronauts on the moon's surface can drink it and we're able to extract oxygen from it and ultimately also rocket fuel. Plus, every ounce of water that we don't have to bring with us from Earth ultimately makes our mission cheaper. Plans for a lunar station are taking shape. The South Pole at the edge of the Shackleton Crater is a possible location for a research village. It is said that there is not only water there, but also sun to provide the necessary energy. Scientists all over the world are already working on designs for lunar colonies. In Bremen, at the Center for Applied Space Technology and Microgravity, Christiana Heinecke conceives and designs ideas for living under extreme conditions. My work is to ensure that when people land on the moon, they can move into a house there, move into a habitat and survive there. The demands placed on extraterrestrial colonization are enormous. Scientists must be able to live, work, and research on the surface of the celestial body. Despite cosmic radiation, meteorite impacts, and extreme temperature fluctuations. I think it's only a matter of time before a separate culture will develop on the moon. A separate society with its own moon music or moon painting or whatever. I think this will happen sooner rather than later. Science fiction author Anne Alert estimates that 2044 could be the year in which this happens. In his debut novel, Munatics, his hero sets off on a journey to the moon. Climate change, the growing threat of terrorism, the Earth has finally ceased to be a place of longing for mankind. The globetrotters of the world are headed for a new destination the moon. And the cosmic travel guides agree that Aristarchus Crater and the Schrotus Valley are the new hotspots. Both are located on the near side of the moon. The hero of the novel simply climbs aboard a spacecraft to take a vacation on the moon. The marvelous view of the rising Earth is, of course, included. The starting point of the story is Lavania, a luxury hotel where the protagonist actually only plans to stay for two weeks, but then ultimately stays for two years. And to his surprise, because it wasn't in the travel guide, he discovers that there's a hippie settlement a few craters away. And in the end, this hippie community on the moon represents utopia, of course. But unfortunately, the project developers arrive and want to drive the hippies away. So, a very earthly problem, I'd say. Lunar travel for all is an idea that has been around for quite some time. Moon tourism could become reality in our century. But despite his intensive research, Anne Alet still can't understand why people are so keen on visiting the moon. Of course, there is the question of whether a travel destination like this makes sense. Because basically, you could just as well be living inside a nuclear reactor as on the moon. There's no water, no air to breathe, cosmic radiation. The best thing about the moon is probably the view of the Earth. And for that, even our science fiction writer from Berlin would set out on a journey to the moon. Flight today would certainly not look like it did for early film architects and directors. The question of what awaits us on the moon when we get there has always captured man's imagination. Could human history be reinvented on the moon? With astronomy student Friede, legendary film pioneer Fritz Lang first sent a woman to the moon in 1928 
Together with her fiancé and the moon expert Manfeld, she lands on the far side of the satellite. Manfeld suspects large gold deposits there, and is proved correct. The Apollo missions massively changed the image of the moon. The analysis of the rock samples showed that the moon is a child of the Earth. Without the moon rock collected by cosmic researchers during their Apollo missions, we would still be unaware of this today. What can scientists expect to discover when they set off to study the celestial body with modern technology? We don't really know anything about the moon. We were in six different places. But one mustn't forget that the moon is many times the size of Europe. If you land in six different places, pick up a couple of rocks, you don't know anything about it yet. But what we do know about it has now stirred the interest of the energy industry. Large quantities of helium-3 have been deposited in the dust on the surface of the moon over billions of years. Many fusion researchers see the isotope as the energy source of the future. They argue that helium-3-based reactors could even be operated safely in the middle of cities, thus solving the Earth's energy problems. There are many who have now said, we want to be part of it, companies all over the world, but especially institutions like NASA, for example, the American Space Agency, the Japanese or the Russians. Even the Chinese have said they have concrete plans. One future vision of scientists working on energy generation consists of a small fleet of spaceships flying to the moon and establishing a manned base there. Subsequently, helium-3 is collected by astronauts on the surface of the Earth's satellite and brought back to Earth. In addition to transport ships, a space elevator is used for this. How we and the Moon will cope, nobody knows yet. It is high time to clarify a few legal questions in the name of mankind, says Stefan Hober, head of the Institute for Space Law in Cologne. In 1967, the Space Treaty came into being, which after all has been ratified by 106 states. This means that no celestial body can be appropriated by a single nation. It belongs to humanity as a whole. In addition to establishing research stations on the moon, there are also plans for large-scale mining operations. Gold is calling. Stefan Hober therefore travels from one lunar mining conference to the next. He wants to take the moon side. I see it as my task to be the spoil sport, because I think that in all the excitement about a gold rush, people are quite likely to leave the moon behind in conditions that jeopardize environmental stability up there sozusagen die Stabilität dort oben weiter gewährleistet. Having won the first race to the moon 50 years ago, the Americans are obviously determined to stay at the forefront. In 2015, the United States of America granted itself the mining rights for the moon. The Americans are convinced that they achieved a big success with the law they created. But I'm trying to explain to them that they can't do that. That, as the moon basically belongs to everyone, consequently, the legislation has to be made by all of us. It requires an international conference. And because we've actually had the draft since 1979, it's high time we work on it.
good business can be done with the moon. That's always been the case. During the Apollo launches, huge amounts of moon cocktails, Apollo cocktails, and liftoff martinis were sold. Today, there's a long list of full moon products, and everyone advertises with the special powers of the full moon. Full moon is the time to bake, brew, and make cheese. It's possible to buy all kinds of things for a full moon picnic on Earth that advertise with the power of the moon. From moon bread to moon salami. Everything is said to taste fuller when it is made in the light of the satellite. But what will Earthlings living on the moon eat in the future? A Garden of Eden will be delivered to Antarctica in 2018. At minus 45 degrees Celsius, Tests will be conducted as to how astronauts and moon dwellers could be supplied with fruit and vegetables in the future. A vegetable garden in the eternal ice. That is the mission. Only a few hundred meters away from the Neumeyer Research Station, the scientists from Playman set up their greenhouse. They have spent the last two years testing whether it is possible to develop a vegetable garden in a 13 square meter container without soil, daylight or pesticides. Project manager Daniel Schubert is accompanying the test phase from Bremen. In an emergency, he is able to control the systems in the greenhouse from a local control center. Antarctica is pretty similar to the Moon and Mars. The Neumeyer station is completely closed off. Supply is not possible at the moment. You can't just fly in and out. That means the crew is dependent entirely upon itself. And that's a scenario we can't test anywhere else. For the past three days, the team was unable to travel the few hundred meters to the garden container because of snowstorms. And today, too, it's difficult. On the moon, it would not only be minus 45 degrees Celsius. There, man and material would have to withstand minus 170 degrees. Yeah. Hi, Konrad. Ah, hi, Paul. Hello. Geht's dir gut? Ja, mir geht's gut. The Bremen team has an appointment for the daily Skype talk with their colleagues on site. Warte yeah. mal. Yep. Okay. Hallo, Paul. So weit sieht alles gut aus. Everything looks good so far. The plants are growing great. We've had a good harvest again this week. So we're really producing a lot here. Lettuces, for example, I have 24 lettuce heads every two weeks. They really do last two weeks until we've eaten them and the next ones are ready. As far as the cucumbers are concerned, we sometimes get three to four kilograms per week, plus one to two kilograms per week of tomatoes. The vegetables I produce and harvest here are very well received by the crew. We eat vegetables and lettuce from the greenhouse pretty much every day, and we haven't been supplied with fresh food for almost four months now. So all the fresh goods harvested here are very welcome. It's the 10-man Antarctic crew at the Neumeyer that initially benefits from the plentiful harvest. The ISS crew too will soon be able to take a smaller version of the garden with them into space. A garden of Eden to go, so to speak. An issue that's often underestimated is the importance of food on board a space station. When you're in space for half a year, it's really important to be able to give your body everything it needs to not get sick. And on the other hand, also as psychological support. This is really very important, that you still have something to look forward to for lunch or dinner, that you have a good meal. It's also important that you have a variety of food, different dishes that you bring with you, and ideally, sometimes something fresh. It's clear that space agencies have the moon in their sights, but there's something that's jeopardizing their missions. In our orbit, a serious problem is growing, garbage in space. 
Nowadays, we all benefit from space travel in our daily lives, each and every one of us. The weather forecast, for example, would be inconceivable without space travel. Satellite navigation, it's ubiquitous, whether in the car or on foot or by bicycle, would also be impossible without satellites. Telecommunications, during a World Cup, when everyone is glued to the screen, where do the signals come from? Via satellite, of course. And therefore, if this infrastructure is in danger, then our daily lives are in danger. Around 750,000 objects are circling the Earth. The 3,000 satellites that no longer work are the risk. Houston, we have a problem. Colliding space debris. These collisions generate more fragments, and these fragments are candidates for new collisions to come. So follow-on collisions, if you like. And that the, the largest fear that we have is that we enter in some sort of cascading effect, where one collision triggers the next one. And this is not, not anything that will, will happen within a microsecond, like in the movie Gravity, but uh, this is something that will set in slowly, hardly noticeable, but unstoppable. There are plans for a kind of galactic garbage disposal to clean up the orbit in future. The ESA laboratories are working at full speed on technical solutions for this. Gripping arms and nets for retrieving disused satellites are being tested. A young scientist has also set herself the goal of bringing the problem into the public eye. Fatoumata Kebe is an astrophysicist and has just published her doctoral thesis on the trajectories of space debris. Space is far away, so you can't see the problems there. So when we come and say, listen, man has also polluted space, then people are usually surprised. Broken satellites, burnt-out rocket stages, even lost screwdrivers and splintered paint particles. Around 6,500 tonnes of scrap metal are meanwhile racing around above our heads. A problem that affects us all if we want to continue to use our smartphones, the internet and navigation systems in the future and want to go to the moon. NASA has stated in a study that if we continue to leave space debris on this scale, as is currently the case, by 2025 we will no longer be able to send objects into space without them being hit by at least one piece of scrap. If we send a mission to the moon, the risk is even higher because the rocket has to pass through several orbits on its way. No matter where man dares to go, even the first explorers have left more than footprints in the lunar dust. The Apollo astronauts left about 180 tons of equipment on the moon, and that for only six short visits. The aim is to find a sustainable way of interacting with the moon and space. Use of services from space is, is in everybody's interest. Um, mitigating the problem, space debris, uh, should be in everybody's interest as well, because we have generated a global problem that can only be solved on a global scale. It needs a global response. Viewed from Earth, the Moon is still in mint condition. The photographer Ben Proschold is on the trail of the celestial body. Today, he has an appointment with Luna for a photo shoot near Frankfurt. But the Moon is a diva. He must prepare himself carefully in order to get a beautiful picture. Normally, the moon, like the sun, rises in the east. East is about there. But over the course of the year, this shifts a bit, back and forth. And you can now use an astronomy program to calculate precisely that today, the moon will rise 22 degrees south of the east, exactly behind the skyscrapers. And this is virtually a line that I draw on a map from the skyscrapers exactly in this angle. And ideally, we would now be 200 meters further to the right, but there is a road, there are trees, we can't see the skyline. That means that this here is the ideal compromise. The question tonight will be, who is shining more beautifully? The full moon or the lights of the big city? The moon keeps the photographer waiting. After all, which adored one shows up on time for the first date? Then the weather threatens to ruin the party. But suddenly, very briefly, the moon pushes the curtain of clouds away and reveals who is the fairest creature of the night sky. Yeah. 
I'm glad that I live here in an earthly paradise, with chirping birds, green trees and running waters. But as for the moon, I gladly leave it to the Apollo astronauts to visit it. I don't envy them. The moon inspired us to set off for new dimensions. With it, we have rediscovered the Earth. It points to where the real challenges of mankind lie, in our own Garden of Eden. Half a century after the first moon landing, the love affair between man and the moon has anything but cooled. <laughs> Will we be able to treat the eighth continent more carefully than the Earth? Only the next generations will know. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind.